is, rewards no labor save that performed for her benefit. Consequently, she pays all laborers equally, with what they produce outside of her sphere she has no more to do, than with the difference in their voices and their hair. I seem to be positing the principle of inequality, the reverse of this is the truth. The total amount of labor which can be performed for society that is, of labor susceptible of exchange, being, within a given space, as much greater as the laborers are more numerous, and as the task assigned to each is less in magnitude, it follows that natural inequality neutralizes itself in proportion as association extends, and as the quantity of consumable values produced thereby increases. So that in society the only thing which could bring back the inequality of labor would be the right of occupancy, the right of property. Now, suppose that this daily social task consists in the plowing, hoeing, or reaping of two square decameters, and that the average time required to accomplish it is seven hours, one laborer will finish it in six hours, another will require eight. The majority, however, will work seven. But provided each one furnishes the quantity of labor demanded of him, whatever be the time he employs, they are entitled to equal wages. Shall the laborer who is capable of finishing his task in six hours have the right, on the ground of superior strength and activity, to usurp the task of the less skillful laborer, and thus rob him of his labor and bread? Who dares maintain such a proposition? He who finishes before the others may rest, if he chooses. He may devote himself to useful exercise and labors for the maintenance of his strength, and the culture of his mind, and the pleasure of his life. This he can do without injury to any one, but let him confine himself to services which affect him solely. Vigor, genius, diligence, and all the personal advantages which result therefrom, are the work of nature and, to a certain extent, of the individual. Society awards them the esteem which they merit, but the wages which it pays them is measured, not by their power, but by their production. Now, the product of each is limited by the right of all. If the soil were infinite in extent, and the amount of available material were exhaustless, even then we could not accept this maxim, to each according to his labor. And why? Because society, I repeat, whatever be the number of its subjects, is forced to pay them all the same wages, since she pays them only in their own products. Only, on the hypothesis just made, inasmuch as the strong cannot be prevented from using all their advantages, the inconveniences of natural inequality would reappear in the very bosom of social equality. But the land considering the productive power of its inhabitants and their ability to multiply, is very limited. Further, by the immense variety of products and the extreme division of labor, the social task is made easy of accomplishment. Now, through this limitation of things producible, and through the ease of producing them, the law of absolute equality takes effect. Yes, life is a struggle. But this struggle is not between man and man it is between man and nature. And it is each one's duty to take his share in it. If, in the struggle, the strong come to the aid of the weak, their kindness deserves praise and love. But their aid must be accepted as a free gift, not imposed by force, nor offered at a price. All have the same career before them, neither too long nor too difficult. Whoever finishes it finds his reward at the end, it is not necessary to get there first. In printing offices, where the laborers usually work by the job, the compositor receives so much per thousand letters set. The pressman so much per thousand sheets printed. There, as elsewhere, inequalities of talent and skill are to be found. When there is no prospect of dull times for printing and typesetting, like all other trades, sometimes come to a standstill, everyone is free to work his hardest, and exert his faculties to the utmost, 
He who does more gets more. He who does less gets less. When business slackens, compositors and pressmen divide up their labor. All monopolists are detested as no better than robbers or traders. There is a philosophy in the action of these printers, to which neither economists nor legists have ever risen. If our legislators had introduced into their codes the principle of distributive justice which governs printing offices, if they had observed the popular instincts, not for the sake of servile imitation, but in order to reform and generalize them, long ere this liberty and equality would have been established on an immovable basis, and we should not now be disputing about the right of property and the necessity of social distinctions. It has been calculated that if labor were equally shared by the whole number of able-bodied individuals, the average working day of each individual, in France, would not exceed five hours. This being so, how can we presume to talk of the inequality of laborers? It is the labor of Robert Macaire that causes inequality. The principle, to each according to his labor, interpreted to mean, who works most should receive most, is based, therefore, on two palpable errors. One, an error in economy, that in the labor of society tasks must necessarily be unequal. The other, an error in physics, that there is no limit to the amount of producible things. But, it will be said, suppose there are some people who wish to perform only half of their task? Is that very embarrassing? Probably they are satisfied with half of their salary. Paid according to the labor that they had performed, of what could they complain? And what injury would they do to others? In this sense, it is fair to apply the maxim, to each according to his results. It is the law of equality itself. Further, numerous difficulties, relative to the police system and the organization of industry, might be raised here. I will reply to them all with this one sentence, that they must all be solved by the principle of equality. Thus, some one might observe, here is a task which cannot be postponed without detriment to production. Ought society to suffer from the negligence of a few? And will she not venture out of respect for the right of labor to assure with her own hands the product which they refuse her? In such a case, to whom will the salary belong? To society. Who will be allowed to perform the labor, either herself, or through her representatives, but always in such a way that the general equality shall never be violated, and that only the idler shall be punished for his idleness. Further, if society may not use excessive severity towards her lazy members, she has a right, in self-defense, to guard against abuses. But every industry needs they will add leaders, instructors, superintendents, and see. Will these be engaged in the general task? No. Since their task is to lead, instruct, and superintend. But they must be chosen from the laborers by the laborers themselves, and must fulfill the conditions of eligibility. It is the same with all public functions, whether of administration or instruction. Then, Article 1st of the Universal Constitution will be, the limited quantity of available material proves the necessity of dividing the labor among the whole number of laborers. The capacity, given to all, of accomplishing a social task, that is, an equal task, and the impossibility of paying one laborer save in the products of another, justify the equality of wages. 7. That inequality of powers is the necessary condition of equality of fortunes. It is objected, and this objection constitutes the second part of the St. Simonian, and the third part of the Fourierstic, maxims, that all kinds of labor cannot be executed with equal ease. Some require great superiority of skill and intelligence. And on this superiority is based the price. The artist, the savant, the poet, the statesman, are esteemed only because of their excellence. 
and this 